Welcome back to the last part of module 3 about blood transfusion. Now, strictly blood transfusion is a part of fluid therapy since it is a natural colloid, but the approach of um, preparing the product uh, before administering to a patient, the computations and um, the the computations and the complications um, alongside with blood transfusion are very different with crystalloids um, and other colloids like HETA starch, so it deserves its own um, video. All right, let's begin. There are three types of blood products, all right, and these are general, the most common types of blood products used in the clinical setting specifically for small animals, right? You have fresh whole blood. This is blood collected directly from a donor without any processing done. So it contains everything that you expect in a blood, in a blood sample, RBCs, WBCs, clotting factors, proteins, platelets, and all plasma components. While packed red blood cells, as its name would indicate, would only have RBCs. So these RBCs are centrifuged with most plasma removed. It would have some uh, within it. And um, in some cases, it might include some WBC, all right? And the other one would just be getting the fluid component of blood, which is the plasma. There are different kinds of plasma. The fresh frozen plasma, which you think is uh, a misnomer because how can it be fresh if it's frozen, <laughs> right? So this is plasma from fresh whole blood collected from that donor blood and frozen in the first eight hours after collection. And it'll only be good for one year, right? It's not one year of age for the donor. It's just the one year of age of the collection. And it contains all plasma components, clotting factors, albumin, right? And the computation for how much a patient would need for the specific um, blood products would be different depending on what they are. Number one, fresh whole blood, right? This is indicated for patients who are suffering from acute hemorrhage, who are losing blood. So they uh, ideally, they would also need blood to replace that loss. For patients with severe thrombocytopenia, remember fresh whole blood contains all the components. Packed red blood cells might be uh, cheaper to find, but they do not have the platelets for it. So, and also other situations uh, which need a multi-component therapy. So if we are transfusing a blood, uh, fresh whole blood, which is freshly collected from a donor, this is how we uh, compute for the transfusion volume. We get the body weight in kilograms of the recipient, and for um, we multiply that by a constant for dogs, it is 40 ml. The constant for cat is 30 ml. Multiply that by this, right? You have the desired PCV for your patient minus the PCV of your patient, the current, and divide that by the PCV of the donor, right? Now, of course, you, you give fluid, you give whole blood because your patient is losing blood. So you want to elevate the PCV, the current PCV or the pack cell volume of your patient, right? So that's how you compute for the transfusion volume. And there is also one way to make this easy. Like for example, if you have fresh whole blood and you do not know the, 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 the PCV of the donor, um, the constant is 20 ml per kilo of fresh whole blood, right? 20 ml per kilo of the patient that you give it to increases the PCV by 10%, right? So basically, 2 ml per keg increases it by 1%. And 10 ml per keg of fresh whole blood increases the platelet count by 10,000 cells, uh, 10,000 platelets per microliter, right? So just remember this. Um, I, I'm not going to include some uh, computation for this, but in the... Uh, problem sets, you will have blood transfusion computations, and it is up to you now how to figure out how you're going to compute for that because everything is in there. In here, it's basically commonsensical. All right. Now, fresh whole blood collected from a donor must be used within four to six hours. Right. The platelets and the clotting factors lose their activity after that time frame, especially if you are not um, doing any 
processing for it, all right? So if you are um, looking to administer fresh whole blood for the benefit of the platelets and clotting factors, you have to make sure that you give it within four to six hours after collection. For packed red blood cells or PRBC, this is more commercially available than fresh whole blood, number one, because fresh whole blood can only live for four to six hours. Number two, um, packed red blood cells can be is um, manuf not manufactured it uh the fresh blood will undergo a procedure and then they could get the rbcs so it's not strict as to the amount that you can get right and the only indication for this is anemia if you need to increase the packed cell volume of the animal if it has less uh, if it has low rbc counts right and the dose for this would be 6 to 15 ml per kilo, but most veterinarians would just follow the rule of 1 mil per keg of PRBC increases the PCV by 1%. Right? So if I tell you that the, the original PCV of this patient is 12%, I want it to be increased into 22%. How much uh, ml of blood do you need? All right. Usually, that's the questions in the problem sets. Now, lastly, fresh frozen plasma is indicated for coagulopathies, those patients with clotting factors deficiency, um, severe systemic diseases, which needs extra help of proteins in this plasma. All right. The dose for this uh, in literature is 10 to 20 ml per keg. There is a maximum of 45 ml per keg, which is usually used. Um, for severe cases of hyperproteinemia, um, the higher end of the range, which is 20 mL per keg, is chosen for patients with von Willebrand disease and hemophilia A. Okay. Now, what's the difference between fresh frozen plasma and frozen plasma? Plasma is, uh, which is more than greater than one year of age, is called frozen plasma. It might not work as as well as fresh frozen plasma. Um, in terms of the proteins because it has denatured or it can only live for around a year. So it all depends on what you need from this blood product. All right. So when we talk about a blood transfusion, blood typing is always in, in this uh, story. All right. This is the detection of species-specific and antigenic genetic protein markers on the surface of the red blood cells. Right. For us, we have A, B, uh, we have the AB group for humans. For dogs, it's the dog erythrocyte antigen 1.1. Why is this the pointed out um, antigen? This is the most antigenic and is responsible for most transfusion reactions. So imagine it like this. A DEA 1.1 negative red blood cell would not have that antigen expressed on its surface. right? And it acts basically like the normal immunochromatograph thing <laughs> you know like the normal uh, tests for viral diseases or for antibody works the same way you drop you just drop uh, a, one drop of blood you wait for it and then if it develops a line on the DEA1 then that's a positive right and DEA1.1 has it is not just the antigen in dogs there's a lot 1.1 1 1.2 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 there's a lot. It's just that 1.1 is the most antigenic, right? And they say that 50% of the canine population is negative. The other one is positive. Now, how does this affect the way that you are going to transfuse the animal, right? So you have a donor, you have a recipient. The DEA 1.1 positive can donate to the DEA 1.1 positive. It's fine. The DEA 1.1 negative, since it is a negative, it can also um, uh, donate to the DEA 1.1 positive because it's not expressing any antigens, then there will not be any cross-reaction and no transfusion reaction will occur. However, DEA 1.1 negative recipients can only receive from DEA 1.1 negatives, right? Because if not, the antibodies, in, sorry, the immune system of uh, the dog with DEA 1.1 negative will mount an immune response against the red blood cells that is receiving from DEA 1.1 positive, thinking these are antigens that need to be fought off by the immune system. So that ends up worsening the problem, right? In felines, it is uh, it's the same with people. It's the AB group, right? You have a type A, type B, type AB. Now, most, most, right, most, um, uh, patients, uh, most cats are type A, 
right? They possess this naturally occurring allo antibodies against the blood type antigen they are lacking, right? So um, you can see the type B cats have strong anti-A antibodies, type A cats have weak anti-B antibodies. That is why, for example, um, most cats are type A, rare ang type B, but they can, they happen, they occur. Even in, um, in my experience in, what do you call this, in Hong Kong, we have a blood bank for type A cats. Basically, the packed red blood cells for, for cats there is always type A. So when a patient comes in, right, when, a, when a cat comes in with type B, it's very hard to find a blood donor for them in cases they need it. That's why, since, again, the small animal industry there is very, very good, they have Facebook groups of owners have uh, with cats with type B um, uh, blood group, right? And they, and the thing is that they help each other. You know, suddenly there's an owner who comes in with their fat British short hair cat saying, "Hey, I'm willing. I'm willing for. Uh, I'm willing to to screen my cat if she can donate blood for this for this cat that." Uh, that that had that advertisement in in facebook that posted in facebook you know and they're there already like after an hour they come in we have like three type b cats waiting to be blood typed and cross matched for for these animals to be to receive blood you know, this is just such a good industry there right so um what dictates if they get type a type b type ab there's an inheritance pattern for it i just uh, decided to um, place it in there Right? The problem lies with when um, tomcats and queens breed with each other and they have different um, blood types and there is a possibility that they can have um, kittens with a different blood group from them. Like for example, like I showed the inheritance pattern there. A is dominant over B. Right? A will always be dominant over B. AB is rare, but it is recessive to A, so A will always overcome AB. But it is co-dominant with B, meaning, what, what, go back to your veterinary uh, genetics, all right? If AB will, um, if AB will, what do you call this? Um, will breed with, a, with a, another cat with a B, there's a possibility they will produce um, they will produce a kitten with an AB a blood group or even an A, which actually causes that cat, that kitten, when it is receiving, um, what do you call this, uh, milk, the colostrum from the mom. The colostrum would have antibodies against its own blood. So the, the, the colostrum that is supposed to protect the kittens from, you know, the the infectious diseases that is common for them is actually making it attack its own blood cells, right? Because it's not compatible with its mom. That's what you call neonatal isoerythrolysis, right? Google that. Now, how do we know if a certain dog or a cat are fit to donate blood, right? Same thing as us. We have to satisfy a certain criteria for us to be able to donate blood. Me being a tattooed doctor, I cannot donate for uh like a year after i get my own i got i get another tattoo so i usually schedule that because it's good if you regularly donate blood if you don't have any underlying condition it has, it's actually good for you right so uh for dogs weight is uh should be greater than 25 kilos so you would expect those that goes in your clinic to donate would be the big dogs could be a labrador golden retriever big ass um <laughs> German Shepherds, right? Or even mixed breed dogs, we were just so big. They're, the pack cell volume must be more than 40%, more than or equal to 40%. They must be negative for bloodborne pathogens like uh, um, blood parasites, heartworms, especially, and ideally DEA 1.1 negative, especially if your patient is DEA 1.1 uh, negative as well, all right? Again, it's just the ideal thing. For cats, ideally the weight is greater than five kilos, so you would expect this would be the big British short hair, um, exotic short hairs and such. Um, even Maine Coons are very, they have very big 
jugular veins. The PCV should be greater than 30% and must be a compatible blood type with the recipient. That is very important because as we have discussed, uh, the blood groups of the feline of cats are very reactive. All right. Um, hopefully they're type A. Um, type A can only receive type A. Um, if a type A receives a type B, uh, it's fine because they have weak antibodies, but still, you don't want to risk it, right? And if the dogs need to be negative for blood-borne pathogens, same with cats. But we're going into toxoplasma, hemobartonella, even some viral diseases like feline leukemia virus and feline immunodeficiency virus, which can be transmitted via blood, right? So how do we do this? How do we find out how much, how much to get? from a dog donor, um, dogs may donate up to 20% of their blood volume. The thing is their blood volume is around 8.5% of their body weight, all right? So so that you don't have to, uh, what do you call this? Do the math anymore. I did it for you, all right? So the maximum for dogs, even if they exceed 30 kilos or 35 or 40 kilos, the maximum is 450 mils of blood, all right? For cats, they can donate up to 10% of their blood volume, and that would be maximum of 45 ml of blood, even if their body weights are much higher than what is in the criteria, all right? So how do we do that? Um, this is how you actually collect blood from a cat. In a dog, you get the bag, right? You get that bag there for dogs, and it's usually the same uh, size of blood bag that is used for us when they collect blood from us because they also collect the same amount, right? Um, the donor animals are sedated. They need to be because when you get blood from the external jugular vein, they cannot move until um, the blood collection is done, right? And the, uh, an IV catheter is placed for this animal. IV fluids, of course, when you are removing blood, you don't want the animal to you know hypercompensate for it so you need to replace that blood as well after um the blood collection is done now i have one question right if i am if i am getting blood from we call this from this cat uh you can see that the left external jugular vein is being prepped okay the iv is on the right you can see that, right? The, the, intro, the, the IV line is on the right, connected to its right cephalic vein. Why? Why does it need to be contralateral? Huh? Actually, this is uh, applicable if you are giving fluids at the same time that you are collecting blood. All right? If you are giving fluids at the same, if you are replacing the blood that you are getting at the same time, kung sabay mo tong ginagawa, Naka on yung fluids, you need it to be positioned contralateral so that the blood that you are getting is not diluted by the fluids that you are currently administering to your patient. So if you are um, actively giving fluids to the animal on its right cephalic vein, which will be drained by the right jugular vein, sorry, brachial vein, and then um, mixed with um, the external jugular vein in the you know, in the axilla area, right? Um, then you don't want it diluting the blood that you're getting because you're not getting full blood. You're getting a, a big part of it as, you know, normal isotonic crystalloids, right? But if you are not doing it at the same time, then the contralateral thing um, doesn't matter, all right? So again, this dog is, um, what call this, sedated. You're going to occlude um, the thoracic inlet to make the jugular vein bulge. You will constantly massage that area to constantly um, hope that the blood will continually flow to your bag, right? This is one all right, video for that. Prep the animal. Oh, yep. She starts with a shave and then heads straight for the operating table. She's doing real good. Once the doctors find a vein, the donation begins. Now, you can let gravity do the work, right? You can see here that um, the line, the IV line connected to the jugular vein catheter of the animal is connected to the bag. The bag is on top of a weighing scale. 
and you wait for it to reach 450 because 450 grams is equal to 450 ml now to make that faster if you want to make that faster you can actually connect it to a suction machine okay to make it uh basically make the process more efficient since they're collecting from a big dog um which is a very big jugular vein there's no possibility of collapse of that jugular vein even if you suction it up but for dr bruce benj and this dog roxy it is just another day at the office kind of like the slowest process they say a watch pot never boils and kind of your blood bag doesn't fill as fast as when you're watching it so roxy comes to the animal emergency center once every two months but it's not because she needs help in fact other dogs actually need help from her so that basically is about 450 mils this container is taking in Roxy's blood, and the dog is actually awake the entire time they do it. She's a very... Alright, let's see the next. video for this all right so um if your patient is very docile and is very used to getting blood some of them won't sedate but what we do is always sedate because we do not want to risk it we're using a very big uh, um, needle for this it's usually an 18 gauge or a 20 gauge all depends on the size of the animal but you would want a bigger circumference of that catheter to make sure uh, not catheter, sorry, needle, right? To make sure that the blood will go in without any clots to form. And then you bandage that um, area. Right there around her neck and then she'll walk out of here. Literally five minutes after the See, operation she's not began, awake. She's it sedated. is already complete. There's her finished Look. product. Roxy's already donated a bag of blood. And just minutes later, down goes the dog. And Roxy is on her way to resting. And you'll watch and she'll walk out of here. He's doing really well. Now meet this dog, Jake. He's the recipient of this blood donation. Heart rate is nice and stable. Moline resident Stephanie Ake re-owns this border call. To get down low. Sorry, I, I want you to see that. This dog, Jake. All right. You see that machine that is hanging on the cage of the animal? That's the IV machine. Right, that's IV pump, what we call an IV pump. And the IV line passes through like a, a groove in that area, and you could actually enter the rate that it goes into that uh, into the animal. So you don't have to hang the fluid so high because you're not relying on gravity anymore. You're excuse me, you're relying on a machine to pump the fluid into the animal. Hey, who is the recipient of this blood donation? Heart rate is nice and stable. Pauline. All right, as you can see here, it says 75, meaning the transfusion rate is at 75 mils per hour. All right, this is a HESCA pump. This can actually bolus your animal 999 mils per hour. All right, that's how fast it is. President Stephanie Acre owns this border collie Sheltie. The dog had a problem with its red blood cells, so he needed a transfusion. For hours, Jake Late here is this cord help send blood into its body. Seems like he's got some more energy going on. All right, now, what do we actually use for blood transfusion? You need a blood transfusion set. This is like the IV line that we discussed before, and it is always set at 20 drops per ml. All right, now, the, the blood transfusion set has a, where is my, oh, I can't find my, uh, arrow <laughs> sorry um if you look at the upper part of the transfusion set the canister there the plastic it has a filter in it already so that if there is any clots that develop in the in the blood bag it can be filtered out so that it wouldn't go into the animal and cause problems and some practitioners uh, would still want to have another filter Okay, to prevent any of those clots or fibrin from getting into um, the the recipient animal so they can actually place this you know the orange 
plastic there, you can actually plug it into the IV bag and uh, act as a filter as well. You need an IV catheter and your blood product, right? Now, what you do before is you check this, the vital signs of the animal, heart rate, RR, temperature, before transfusion so that you could set a baseline, right? To prevent any transfusion reactions, you can pre-administer uh, an antihistamine. Usually what they use is diphenhydramine at 0.5 mg per kg IV to help avoid the transfusion reactions, All right? Important things to note. All stored or frozen blood products must be gradually brought to room temperature prior to administration. You do not heat it, right? You do not, um, except for plasma, you can heat that. But for those for blood, you just let it wait for room temperature. Now, if your patient is dying, <laughs> okay, because sometimes a lot of kids would take me so literally. Ah, doc, hindi pa ano eh, hindi pa, hindi pa warm. So, hintayin ko muna mag warm. Your patient is dying, all right? The body <laughs> will, will benefit more uh, with, the, with the cold blood right now as compared to the warm blood later when your animal is already dead. All right. So, ayo ka na may magliliteral sa akin na, "Do, I'm I'm waiting it to warm up, you know? But you I I can't even I can't even uh what do you call this? <laughs> Describe it anymore, the frustration that I get because I was like, uh, "Yeah, I taught you that, but I also taught you have common sense, you know?" <laughs> All right. Uh, a blood unit thought from being frozen should be used within 24 hours. Um, if you are not going to use a blood unit or a blood bag, um, you should, uh, it should not remain at room temperature longer than four hours and a filter must be used with it, especially for fresh whole blood, right? Now, rate. Usually, the transfusion rate is 10 mil per keg per hour, max of 20 for those uh, needing it fast. But what we just do, because of course, the, the amount of transfusion volume would be very... What do you call this? Uh, would be very variable depending on the kilo and the PCV that you want. So it's usually just a total of four hours to give a transfusion volume with one half of the transfusion rate for the first hour. You need the first hour to be slow because you're introducing something new to the animal and you need to monitor for any transfusion reactions, right? Patients ideally is monitored every 15 minutes for the first hour. You could imagine the, the, you know, the, the job or the work that comes with it. Monitoring, getting temperature for every 15 minutes. Honestly, it gets, gets really taxing and exhausting. Right? And what are you looking for? What are the clinical signs of transfusion reactions? Or meaning the immune system is actually mounting an immune response to this, uh, to this blood product. Elevated heart rate, elevated um, respiratory rate or difficulty in breathing, fever, vomiting, orticaria, muscle tremor, seizures, basically anaphylactic reactions. Now, if it's mild, if they're just restless, there's mild tachypnea, you, need, you just need to pause the transfusion and observe, right? If the animal um, settles down, you can continue with the transfusion, but it needs to be slower. It's now given a 2 to 5 mil per kg per hour. Now, if the reactions are moderate to severe, like changes in heart rate, um, recordings of arrhythmia or severe dyspnea, you need to stop the transfusion, give a steroid or an antihistamine, or in severe cases wherein there is a uh, arrest, then you might need to consider epi. Right? Now, if you when you are in a clinic, of course, uh, this would be entirely... Uh, dependent on the state of the patient. For example, we've had patients who developed fever while receiving transfusion. But the thing is, they won't die from fever, but they will die from not getting that transfusion. So you need to, to weigh these benefits and risks with um, what the entire, what the, what the animal can gain from what you're doing. All right. So uh, blood transfusion, we could actually discuss this for a week because I haven't even discussed cross-matching. Um, so this is just an overview. Again, blood transfusion is done in the Philippines, but not as much as I want it to be. Uh, commonly done in other countries as a routine stabilization method, especially during surgery, wherein blood products are very much commercially available. One, one bag of blood product, which of uh, packed RBC, which is around 125 mil, 
is around uh, five to six thousand. I don't, I don't know if that increased. It's usually around five to six thousand pesos per bag per one hundred twenty-five ml, right? So you can see it's always it's always a money issue when we discuss these things. Of ano yung wala sa atin, ano yung meron sa iba. It's always just a money issue, and and um, if you can actually sell something like that in the Philippines, some owners would go for it, some won't. All right. So that is it for module three. Again, that is why I said it's going to be around three hours. Uh, fluid therapy is already two hours, and I didn't even bother to you know just do a zoom for it because you're just gonna get get a swamped with all of this and i don't know if you're if you're gonna what, what what will happen to you after it all right so thank you for listening again i expect a lot of questions about it um i may post some questions in google classroom as group discussion and i hope you will be able to participate please wait for uh um the problem set file that i will be posting with the links for uh for these videos all right thank you so much and have a good day bye